I'm Rob Johnstone from Woodworkers Journal, but I'm here talking with Derek Sherson from MAS Epoxies. Rockler is bringing in a deep pour epoxy from MAS, and I think it's really cool. Lots of people are really engaged in this new uh, technique, so Derek's going to teach me how to do it. So, can we pour deep up deep pour in this little block here? Yeah, we sure can. What's the first thing we need to do? First thing we would need to do is make sure everything is level, <coughs> so you get a completely level pour when it's all finished up. Mm -hmm. um, We'll basically shim it up the sides and then we can start mixing the epoxy okay. and give it a go. Let's give it a book. Let's, let's, let's see how we're doing here. How level does it need to be? Uh, I'd say it's more than that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> more like that? Yep. All right. So now we got it level. So this idea of a deep pour, how do you know how deep you can actually pour a layer of epoxy? I've heard, you know, quarter inch, one inch, two inches. I, I don't know how you make that determination. Yep, so the deep pour system is mass and temperature sensitive. Um, the rule of thumb I always would explain to people is the warmer the temperatures, the thinner you should pour, and the cooler the temperatures, like around 60 degrees, the thicker you can pour. So there are ways to manipulate the system. I've seen guys do two inch pours at 60 degrees at night, and then they shut the heat off in their shop and they're able to stall that reaction. Mm -hmm. So rule of thumb in the warmer temperatures, if you're working above 75 degrees, you don't want to go over a half inch depending on how big of a void you're filling. So with this piece of walnut right here, we'll be able to do this all in one shot since it's only about two inches deep and oh, probably about nine inches wide. So we shouldn't have any problem with this, but if you scale this up to, oh, if this is about two and a half feet wide and two inches thick, you would want to do an inch at a time at right around 70 degrees. So. Okay. Just a couple of questions. So is this stuff going to, if I touch it with my skin, is it going to burn me or anything like that? So once the two, once the resin and the hardener are mixed, that's we always recommend wearing gloves just because all epoxies are corrosive and it can be hazardous. But mm -hmm. we always want to make sure we're being safe, so we always wear gloves. Mm -hmm. um, once the epoxies start to react with this system, it's going to be a very long time. But if you were to get anything on your hands, you can just wash it off with some denatured alcohol. Um, warm soapy water and you'll be fine. So, okay. so um, it, Derek has already given me some advice on a bigger uh, pour that I'm going to be doing later and he had, he had told me that I should use this, um, what's it called? The penetrating epoxy sealer. Yes. It's a two to one mix ratio. The viscosity is very low. Uh, it has the consistency of water. So this was actually designed for restoring and restructuring dry or rotted wood. So what it does is when it goes into the wood, it's so thin that it's actually bleeding into the wood grain. And once that sets up and cures, it's basically creating an eggshell barrier to where once you pour the deep pour epoxy, any air or moisture left in the wood, it's not gonna kick out any bubbles or foam or anything like that, so. And you mentioned, even though we're not gonna do it, that this would have been a good place to use the deep, uh, the, uh, the penetrating, and why is that? Yeah, just it's kind of just like a safety concern as far as like your piece, I know, Wood is not cheap, and if you were to skip a step prior, you could potentially get bubbles and foam. It is fixable. You're just going to have to sand it down a little bit and do another pour. Uh, the, the penetrating epoxy is basically the first step as to eliminating risks of air and moisture and foam coming out while the epoxy is here. All right. Well, now we're going to get busy uh, mixing some epoxy. So somehow we have to figure out how much resin it requires to fill this little weird bowl that I carved out. How would a per and then you have to have the right ratio of this stuff to this stuff and how do you go about figuring that stuff out? Yeah correct so <clears throat> the system is three to one mixed ratio by volume or weight so by excuse me by volume is three to one by weight it is a hundred grams part A resin to 28 grams part B hardener. So it's slightly three to one but by weight it's just a little bit different because the weight of the resin is heavier than the hardener. I must, I must have a lot of resin in me. Yeah. <laughs> so another way to calculate how much you're going to need to fill up the void is we actually have a resin calculator on our website oh, cool. at mossepoxies.com. You can just type in Moss Epoxies resin calculator and you basically type in the dimensions of the project you're working with and it calculates the exact amount of uh, gallons that you'll need for the project. So, All right. And so now we're going to be doing it by volume when, when, when we uh, mix it up here, right? Correct. Yep. We'll do 34 or 32 ounces of resin and then we'll do uh, 11 ounces of hardener. So 
So do you need to be worried about getting bubbles in it or anything at this point in time? So luckily with the deep pour system, it self-releases air on its own with the extended working time. Most uh, more simple systems such as like one-to-one -one systems or two-to-one, mm -hmm. if you mix it too fast, like if they, let's say like a power drill, if you were mm -hmm. to you're going to yeah. whip a ton of air into that and it's going to take a while for those bubbles to release to the surface. Whereas mm -hmm. with the deep pour system, it is so low in viscosity that when you're mixing it up, it has the consistency of water basically. So when you pour it, it's very clear and you will notice that all the bubbles will start to rise up to the surface and then pop on their own. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't hurt to hit it with a uh, heat gun or a torch because that can just kind of eliminate them even more. But for the most part, we designed it to self-release air. Outside. Nice, so, nice. Because that's a big problem for a lot of folks. Yep. So we're going to be adding some mix-all to color this. Uh, I know that that's compatible with your system. Um, what about dyes? Are dyes compatible? Yes. So we usually recommend like a mica powder or uh, alcohol ink. Mix-all is a great example. It's very, <clears throat> it's very dense, so a little bit goes a long ways, just like other mica powders. Mm -hmm. The difference between, like, let's say, mix-all and a mica powder, the, the ink will be more translucent and won't settle in any way, whereas a mica powder, if you were to let it sit and not stir it occasionally, everything will settle to the bottom and you won't get that pattern. So there is a timing aspect that comes into it okay. if you want to create a certain pattern. Now we'll just dump this into a bigger bucket here. So we're going to mix in here. We don't need to work. It's already pre-measured, so we don't need to worry about the possible stuff. Again, the hardener, the, it's very, very thin, so it has a consistency of water, basically. So now we start to stir. Can I stir it with a popsicle stick? Oops. Yeah, you sure can. If you want to eliminate some time, you can always take a power drill with okay. these mixing attachments. Well, I'll let you use that power mixer, but I'm going to put some of this stuff in there. It's a brown mix-all. Just a drop? Yeah, I'd probably do about one or two. See how that looks? Now I'm Mr. Power Mixer. Yep, and then again, just to be safe and not be able to get epoxy all over the place, you want to usually just put it in very slowly and then slowly start to uh -huh. up and make sure you really work it around the edges and on the bottom. So mixing it thoroughly is an important detail. Correct. A lot of uh, user error is when the epoxy isn't correctly mixed, so some people might get soft spots. Uh, mixing is a very huge part of this to make everything. Make sure everything reacts correctly. Mm -hmm. Can you overmix? Oh uh, no, you can't overmix. But with other systems like one to one, if you were to pour this much epoxy in this large of a quantity, mm -hmm. and you were to mix too long, eventually the chemicals are going to react and it's going to start to kick off. Oh yeah, that is not good when you're ready to pour if your epoxy starts to gel. So with this system, I usually mix for about. Oh, with the power drill, probably about one or two minutes. If I were doing it by hand, it would probably be more like five minutes. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Well, that's important for me to know because I've got a few gallons to pour in that, <laughs> <laughs> in that piece behind me. So this is, this is giving, me, giving us a consistent color. What if I wanted to put streaks of color into some epoxy? How would I go about doing that? Well, you can mix and match colors. You can also mix and match like a, a pigment and an ink. Just uh -huh. like mix all in any mica powder. And the mica powders, they're, you don't really get a very flat color with those. Everything's going to have some metallic shine to it. Uh -huh. So some people will put in a little bit of uh, mica powder into their inks to kind of give it some more shine or glitter uh -huh. or flare, I guess. Yep. Um, but yeah, you can mix colors to kind of create your own. So, we've used a few containers here. Um, my people, woodworkers, are pretty thrifty. And so they're looking and they say, well, we can't throw that thing away. Can you reuse these articles or do you really need to keep the, the chemicals from, from getting in touch with each other? And what use does this uh, denatured alcohol have? Yeah, so another great thing about mixing by, with a drill is that once this epoxy will harden on there, you can basically soak it in some denatured alcohol and just kind of stir it around in a cup like so and then it'll basically just pop right off and you'll be able to reuse it. Same thing goes for the mixing buckets. What, whatever is left in this that cures, you can basically just squeeze the bucket and it'll pop right out 
in the form of that bucket. You can just go ahead and reuse it. We do recommend just wiping it out with uh, denatured alcohol just to be safe and make sure everything's... So there's no chemicals possible. left behind. Yeah. Correct. Yep. Yeah. So. All right, but these littler pieces, they should probably be thrown away. Correct, yeah, since we did the two-pour method, one just has resin and one just has hardener, uh, we could clean them out with denatured alcohol and reuse them. My past experience, I just usually toss them. Um, kind of just depends on what availability you have to plastic measuring cups and things like that. So, okay, yeah. cool. So now we get to pour. Yep. I'm going to let you do that, okay? So good. Real quick, I'm just going to take this mixing stick and stir okay. around this denatured alcohol to kind of clean it up a little bit. That way we can reuse it. Nice. Nicely right. done. <coughs> cool. Now we're going to pour. Yep, the box is all mixed up. Uh huh. And usually when you're pouring the deep pour, since it's very watery, yep. you want to go as slow as possible. You don't want to splash it in there and have mm -hmm. like over pour or anything like that. So give it a go here. So that really does flow very, very smoothly, almost like water. There we go. I would go a little bit more. That but it's gonna cut it's gonna flow right over here, isn't it? Yep. Somebody got too aggressive with his <laughs> car. Yeah. yeah. So the with the deep pour the thinner the layer, the longer it'll take to cure since it's mass and temperature sensitive. Mm -hmm. So it's going to cure from the center out. Oh, so wow. Whenever I want to check after, let's say, 12 hours, I would kind of take a popsicle stick and poke it right in the center, or with my finger, of course, with the rubber glove on, you can kind of tap the center. Mm -hmm. And then on the edges, you'll notice it'll be very, like, gummy. Yeah. This could be hard, and this could be kind of gummy since it's so thin. Mm -hmm. So, again, mass and temperature sensitive. So this is going to, uh, you don't recommend, so I, if I build up an outer rim and then I pour another one on, I should wait at least 24 hours. Correct. Yep. And then I can test it to see if it's tacky. If it's really hard, say it got warm in here, it got really hard, then I need to put a little bit of tooth on it. Yep. And then Just pour again. Okay. Yep. And then between layers, uh, whenever you sand, you always want to wipe down with a denatured alcohol just to make sure your surface is very clean. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, you can already start to see the bubbles self-releasing on the center mm -hmm. of this here. So, so what what does this do for us? So the torch that'll eliminate any surface bubbles. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can go ahead and let me give it a try. Wave it over, and it'll turn it like glass. So I don't want to get too close. It's good. Usually about four to six inches off the surface. Is that good enough? I see a bubble there. Just chase them until they're gone. Yep. So again, with this system, we designed it to be self-releasing. Mm -hmm. So over the next couple hours, you're going to still see these bubbles come up and just pop it on the surface uh -huh. by themselves. So which is great, so you don't have to tend to it. Unlike other one-to-one -one systems, where you would most likely need to torch every mm -hmm. ten minutes for a total of thirty minutes. So yeah, but. So that should turn out pretty sweet. So that's awesome. So uh, 24 hours from now, we can pour another one, and um, and that's it. Well, Derek, thank you so much for running us through the basics here. This is going to be an exciting new uh, opportunity for Rockler customers, and I can't wait to see what they get done with it. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you. Yep.